For many people with sight loss, the decision of when to start using a white cane can be complicated and even scary. I'm Laura Bain, and these days I walk confidently down the street with my white cane, but that wasn't always the case. I was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, a degenerative eye disease, at age four. But it wasn't until about 13 when I made the decision to start using a white cane full time. Over the next hour, we'll meet four people with varying degrees of sight loss who are all making the transition to using a white cane. This is White Cane Journeys. Thirty-nine-year-old Samir Asemi of Halifax is new to using a white cane. When I first went out with my cane, it was, you know, having the feel. It's like riding a bike, you know, you can't just jump on a bike and think you can ride it. But you have to learn how to balance yourself. And that was the same thing with the cane. It was like my first time on a bike. It's been a challenge and I'm not, I'm not you know, I still got a long ways to go with my cane. I first lost my vision May 12th of 2020. I, and uh, it was due to uh, a, a fight gone bad. It was due to an assault. And uh, that was a pretty hard pill to swallow. I was very emotional for a minute, for a little while. I confused and, uh, you know, I, I didn't know how to make sense of things. I had to just get myself together and, and realize, okay, this is the way things are gonna be. My self-determination is what kept me going and, and not falling into a depression or a deep, a deep, deep pity, you know? And uh, I had to realize, okay, well, if this is how things are gonna be, I have to pull up. I have to, you know, I have to get myself together. Twelve-year-old Harry Nickerson is a competitive gymnast. Four nights a week, he trains at the Halifax Alta Gymnastics Club. I've been doing gymnastics since I was two years old, so about almost ten years now. I just love that you can like screw up and you won't really get that hurt because you can train to fall properly. That's like kind of the first thing that you learn when you start gymnastics, like falling and landing and jumping. So you won't really get hurt unless something goes like terribly wrong. Harry has retinitis pigmentosa, or RP. His mother, Alexis Nickerson, suspected he might have vision loss about two years ago. He was getting uh, injured frequently. And uh, one night at gymnastics, I happened to be there watching. And um, so Harry's been a gymnast since he was two. And so a very familiar environment for him. And he ran in warm up straight into a bar. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I went, he didn't, he didn't see it. And all of these, I'll say little things added up over the years and kind of like a light bulb went off that uh, he probably wasn't seeing as well as he should. We learned that he had RP when we got referred to the eye clinic at the IWK. Harry can't remember everything from that time, but some details stand out. I do remember when I was at the hospital first getting tested at the IWK. I knew that there was probably something wrong with my vision, so I kind of started bawling. <laughs> I was scared and angry, um, but I did know that I was really mad at the fact that it's such a rare disease and that I had it out of like, the 400,000 people that are born a day, that I was one of the people that got it. <laughs> Initially, uh, it was pretty devastating. So um, yeah, it was rough in the start. How do you tell not e a nine-year-old, not even 10 yet, that they're going blind? RP runs in families. Around the time of Harry's diagnosis, Alexis made a discovery about her own vision. So my journey's 
a little complicated. So I was born really early at 29 weeks and was diagnosed, um, I guess, very early on with retinopathy of prematurity, which can look very much like RP. And so my whole life until uh, we started seeing that Harry was having difficulties, we thought it was ROP. So once he was diagnosed, it wasn't, uh, well, it was assumed and then confirmed that I also have uh, RP. So my, just like Harry, my peripheral vision is affected. I'm night blind, um, I'm light sensitive. It's been hard. I'm not saying that I'd want to ha have, have her have it, but it's been helpful that she's um, been there and understands um, what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, if I'm like, going through something or if, like something just happens and it's kind of scaring me a bit, <laughs> like, she'll understand if it's, in, if, it, if it's involving my vision. Alexis started using a white cane about a year ago. So I really started to use it partly to become more independent, but partly because I knew that's, or and maybe even more so, I knew that's what was coming for Harry and knew um, I had to model this positively for him and be accepting of it. And so that he would also be accepting of a cane himself. 82-year-old Wayne Eyre lives across the harbor in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. He became partially sighted about five years ago. I lost my vision while I was in the hospital for a gallbladder operation, and I had a stroke and a heart attack while I was there. And the stroke took out part of my vision. It, it was kind of a shock. I didn't know I'd lost any vision. And very soon after uh, the operation, the nurse said to me, what's wrong with you, are you blind? And I, I, it kind of hit me like a load of bricks. I um, thought I was suspicious something was going on, but I thought maybe drugs or something. And when she said that to me, I thought, holy crumb, maybe I've got a vision problem now. When he first lost his vision, Wayne struggled to adjust. I felt very useless. I couldn't go out on my own. I, I was suffering from some of the effects of all the drugs I had and, and the stroke did a number on my brain as well as my eyes. And um, I had to start in, all over again. And I, I just got so down on myself, not being able to read the newspaper, uh, not being able to see things on the screen of the computer, not being able to see the type of some that comes on the news, maybe with on the television not seeing things at a distance that I used to see, and not knowing really or understanding what was going on and became very depressed. And I said to my wife, this has got to stop. I can't, we can't, I can't do this. We, there's got to be a, a way or something. And I never knew he had vision loss until recently. Oh yeah. Robert Ganong facilitates Vision Loss Rehabilitation Nova Scotia's Living with Vision Loss program. He says vision loss can lead to depression for some. Vision loss wants to isolate you. The nature of vision loss is to isolate you if you don't do anything to push it back. So if you develop vision loss and you just sort of let, let it wash over you, then you're, you're going to sit home, you're eventually going to become very depressed. So from a... It, from a more cognitive way, you gotta think your way through, you gotta decide, I don't want this to happen to me, so I'm gonna take control of this situation and utilize the services of, of vision loss rehab and the CNIB Foundation, and I'm gonna get myself back in that game, utilize the services, and get to a, a point of action and, and, and maintenance, uh, and get my life back as close as possible to where it was before. Wayne credits the Living with Vision Loss program, which offers weekly support in a group setting with helping him move forward. And I contacted Robert and um, he got a slot for me. And 
It was the principles that they teach on this course that I seem to get people thinking, including myself, about how to, how to do things, how to be more creative and how to maximize what you have so that it makes it easier for you to accept the vision loss and, and run with it. One of the solutions for Wayne was to get an ID cane. At that time, I, I knew about a white cane, but that's all I knew was just a white cane. And I think right from the very beginning, I saw the cane as a tool that I could use to make my life a little bit easier, to avoid some of the pitfalls. Today, he volunteers with the program, which meets virtually due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm called a peer support person, and I'm one of those people that they find out that I'm just like them. I went through this, and I think it helps them because I can relate to the problems they've had and the stumbles they've taken and so on. And, and they see that I've made this progress, it kind of helps them accept their vision loss and get back on that path that they need to to get where they need to be. White Cane Journeys will be right back. You're watching White Cane Journeys. I'm Laura Bain. Hey. Hello. How's it going? Good, how you doing? Good. How was your week? Good, it was good. Busy. Yeah? Yeah. Once a week, Samir Asemi meets with Johanna Stork, an orientation and mobility specialist with Vision Loss Rehabilitation Nova Scotia to work on his white cane skills. We're working on having an understanding with me and my cane and the sidewalk and the street in a, in a simple way to put it and making sure that I always put my cane at lead and instead of feeling like I can do it no without my cane I can't do it if I'm by myself I need to know what to feel for and how to get in touch with my feel between my hand and my cane. While Samir practices, Johanna lags 20 feet or so behind, watching his progress. Starting to use a white cane is just kind of owning that, okay, this white cane is now, it's a tool for independence, so I can do everything that I used to be able to do. And just kind of having that, that mental shift, and it's not, it's not something that's holding me back, it's something that's allowing me to be free. So Samir, how do you find um, listening to the traffic with your toque on? Not bad. It's, it's about the same? Yeah. I guess you've worn your toque before on lessons, eh? Yeah, I, I think I did once or twice, but I mean, it doesn't make it much. Of, it's a little muffled, but I can make it out really good. Yeah. Samir's really a whiz kid. He's doing really, really well. The first thing is, you know, feeling okay to use a cane. You know, it's 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 embarrassing. It it does mess with your ego, especially for me, who I've been very outgoing, being able to do things for myself. You know, don't need you know, don't need the help of anybody when I need to get around. But now that I am blind, I I do need the assistance of my cane. Samir is also a participant in the Living with Vision Loss program. Sometimes it's very easy to feel like you're the only one in this world dealing with this until you have, you know, you hear somebody else's story or hear that there's other people out there that are dealing with great difficulties, that you, you know, with the same difficulties that you're dealing with. Robert Ganong appreciates Samir's attitude. Samir is very practical. You know, he's, he's quite young. He, he wanted to do stuff, I could tell. And being totally blind, when you're totally blind, if you wanna do stuff, then you have to find techniques real quick. Otherwise, you're gonna have significant problems and significant accidents. He was determined to get moving. He had to, he had to accept a white cane. Beyond the program, Samir has support from his fiancée, Monica Noss. 
there is nobody else in the world that I'd want to spend the rest of my life with. He is brave, he's smart, and that is one thing that I knew he could get through. My biggest fear was always everything around him. And it still is, anyone or anything around him. That's what I'm afraid of. Him, I know he could walk through the whole city by himself confidently, and I wouldn't have to worry, just anything else. A car or something that he doesn't hear it or he doesn't hear the the, the beeping of the lights or anything, that's, that's what I'm afraid of. I couldn't ask for any better partner than her. I feel great about us being together. I know sometimes I feel like I might be too much of a nuisance on her, but she always tells me, she's like, you know, she says, as long as we're getting along, and she said, as long as we got our health and our well-being, she says, nothing's too much. Mother and son, Alexis and Harry Nickerson, are navigating their diagnosis together. I think it's important to feel it and grieve and, and go through that part. Um, but we were pretty quick um, to become positive. Uh, and I really, I attribute that to everyone like in our lives, our family and our friends. Alexis hadn't considered getting a white cane until last summer. I had no idea that uh, things like I could use a cane or that that was appropriate for me, that people that aren't fully blind I uh, use canes. Once I realized it was a tool available <laughs> for me and appropriate, I thought, wow, this would be really great to be more independent at nighttime. Harry started using a white cane a few months after Alexis. There certainly were, as accepting as we both are of using a cane, there were definitely some emotions there of, uh, suddenly felt real um, having someone hand Harry a cane and that he needs to use it. They just felt like that it was ready, that I'd need to use it at night time. So they figured that I might need it and that if I started walking the gymnastics that I'd need it just to like tell cars that, hey, maybe, maybe slow down a bit. <laughs> they figured it might be helpful. And when they finally gave the cane that I was using to me, I felt like it was really cool. Like so many things, Harry was just so positive. And I just went, wow, well, all that worry was for nothing um, because he was so uh, accepting. <laughs> That's terrible, no. <laughs> the Nickersons, including Harry's father and sister and their dog, Shadow, are an active family. They talk about Alexis and Harry's changing vision together. It hasn't changed any of our activities, but we're more aware of, okay, it's, it's nighttime. If Harry doesn't have his cane, is somebody there uh, helping him? We're just always thinking of how we can do things, not, well, I can't, I can't do that. It doesn't really come into our vocabulary very often. The decision of when to start using a white cane is different for everyone, especially those experiencing gradual vision loss. I don't know how many times I heard over the years that I'm not ready for that yet. Now, what is it that bothers people about walking outside with a white cane? I think there's a few things. Number one is, if you have low vision, people, you might be able to see enough to see someone seeing you with the white cane and that makes a person maybe feel very self-conscious. And that might be one of the reasons they say, well, I'm not ready for a white cane or I don't want a white cane. The cane has a stigma, a historical stigma that we have to work through. It's, it's not easy. I remember when I was uh, a teenager and, you know, starting to walk outside with a white cane, I even felt a little bit self-conscious myself. As a peer support person, Wayne Eyre often hears similar sentiments expressed. The more serious one is when a person accepts that cane, then they're one of them. And they feel like they've joined, they, they're going to be identified as a disabled person. And I'm not disabled. Oh, I'm, I don't want that cane. And I think that's the most prevalent view I see. 
Queen's own decision to get a white cane came from necessity. I'd taken a couple of pretty bad spills and knocked my head around a little bit and bruised yourself a little bit. And after getting the cane and learning how to use it properly, I was able to avoid that. He got his cane at the CNIB. And they uh, introduced me to various kinds of different canes and tested me a little bit to find the one they thought would be the most suitable. My cane is what they call an identifier, and that tells other people that I do have a vision problem. ID canes are smaller than mobility canes and are typically used by people with some vision. I was looking for something with a minimalist attitude so it would communicate the message and allow me to stay under the radar a little bit. White Cane Journeys will return after the break. Welcome back to White Cane Journeys. But I mean, I, the last handful of times we've been out, like there hasn't ever been a problem crossing a side street, so I think we're pretty much almost there. Samir Asemi's sessions with Johanna Stork are continuing, and there's a lot to consider. Orientation has a lot to do with knowing where you are and if you get disoriented, how to get back on track and knowing where you want to get to and knowing and being able to problem solve how to get from one place to the other and keeping track of things like landmarks and that kind of thing along the way. It could be different types of sounds in the environment, like when you're walking past one area, there might be a wall really close to the sidewalk, so you know, okay, I know it, at this block there's a wall really close to the sidewalk, and at this block there's a really empty parking lot, and that's actually really easy to hear the difference, um, or where different hills are in the city or the neighborhood, and that's a good way to keep track of where you are. I was very confused when it came to all of that until Johanna was training me and showed me how to use all my other senses when I'm outside. And, you know, knowing when I'm off the sidewalk or if I'm off of the curb or if, if I'm coming to like a slope at the end of the sidewalk where I'm crossing the street, how to know and understand that, you know, and if I feel like I'm veering off to stop and either retract back to where I was so I can have a better understanding where I'm going. Think twice, step once, you know, because you won't, you won't get the chance to step again if you fall off of something, am I right? The audio will go when the walk light comes on, okay. so you can just... There it is. That's, so that'll be clear for me to go. Exactly. My body just turned. Another thing to master is street crossings. Okay. Good. This is Samir's first time tackling crossing at a busy intersection. He takes it slow today, getting the lay of the land going sighted guide with Johanna. I still got a long ways to go with my cane, but I, I've, I've found that my cane's been very helpful with, with being able to get around. And I, I feel more confident with my cane than without my cane. Going out there without my cane, it's just like, Throwing, throwing a person that could see in a, in a, in a dark pit. I, I know what you're saying. Like, you can identify things without, so you don't walk into it. Yeah, so it gives you a little more warning time. Yes, so it's, uh, it's been very beneficial and I've been using it. Oh, good. The length of orientation and mobility training depends on the person. Some people, might not have a lot of goals. Um, so if, if somebody's goal is to learn how to get out and about in the community and feel confident when they're with a family member, uh, they might just come in for a session with their family to learn sighted guide technique. For somebody who loses all of their vision quite suddenly and wants to learn everything, how to get around the entire city on a bus and from nothing, it, it's going to be quite a big program. Robert Ganong says Samir's making good progress, so much so that even though Samir's new to the program, Robert made him a peer support person. He has a lot of energy, 
and he's prepared to take his energy and stream it into these different areas, whether it be mobility or whether it be um, independent living skills. If you become totally blind and you're very practical, then that's what's going to move you forward. And he is a very good communicator. He's very tactful. He can talk to other people in the group and say, listen, I've been there. Matter of fact, I'm still going through some of that now. No, he has a lot of times that are not easy, but he has a lot of days that he can say, this was a good day. This was a good day. Meeting peers and role models with vision loss was so important for me growing up, whether it was through the CNIB, Camps for the Blind, or other recreational activities. It helped me feel like I was less alone. One way Harry and Alexis Nickerson are connecting to others with sight loss is through goalball. So we went out to a practice within a couple of months of him being diagnosed and he loved it right away. I've made some new friends too. Um, if I, and I wouldn't have made these friends if I hadn't been diagnosed. It's really been great. We don't want to be taking any power away, so if you get it on the floor right away, then, then it keeps that forward yeah. speed going. Peter Parsons is one of the coaches. Well, goalball is a sport for the blind and visually impaired. It's a Paralympic sport. The unique thing about goalball is that everybody's on an equal playing field because we wear eye shades, so it acts like a blindfold, blacks out all our vision. Alexis, you good to play? His coaches are, are also just incredible. Um, they're both so positive and inspiring, really. Peter also has vision loss and is just an incredible positive role model in Harry's life. So when we showed up there and I met Peter, um, and he was kind of teaching me how to throw. It was a little bit earlier. Um, before the practice, and I kind of just clicked with it. I really loved it. Like I felt like I could like, like do well um, with it, and that it'd be really fun to continue with. Harry, he's very athletic. Like he comes from gymnastics, which gives him a great base as far as his athleticism goes. He's very strong, very fast. Last year, he told me at one point that goalball was now his favorite sport, which kind of surprised, pleasantly surprised me because I know how into gymnastics he is. Do you have a preference for wing? Uh, left or right? Not, Would you prefer no, right? Not at the moment. No? Okay, well, how about you start at left? I find that the way that he coaches is really effective and he's always puts things positively. Like, he'll like, give you some negative thing like something to work on. And then he'll tell you that you did something great and that something positive came out of it. Even if it's not necessarily true, he always tries to make sure that he's including something positive. Good work, guys. Good pass. That looked awesome, guys. Both of you guys had good slides on that. We had so much potential with goalball. Goalball um, being a Paralympic sport, I've, I believe Harry could be a Paralympian in the future. I believe he definitely has that type of potential. Because that's just a block, pass, square up, throw, okay? Peter's day job is working as an orientation and mobility specialist. He's noticed how well Alexis and Harry are adjusting to partial sight. It's amazing to see how well they're adapting, actually. I remember after one of our practices on Thursday evening. And of course, in the winter time, it's getting dark so early. And a lot of times I get a ride home with their family. And so I remember leaving the gym doors and Harry taking out his cane. And um, I'm not sure if you realize I was watching his technique, but of course, as an O&M specialist myself, it's just second nature to notice his technique. And I remember watching him walk in perfect step. Like Harry, Wayne Eyre is discovering new interests. 
you know, it's that old tiny step uh, theory. And you take one at a time, and, and then tomorrow you take another one and another one, and you can soon learn to do, maximize what you have. We get a fair number of birds, and I'm much more tuned in. I tell people now I've learned to talk bird, and when I'm sitting out there listening to them. I try to imitate their sounds and their whistles and so on, and that's something I never did before in my life, not at all. He's also out walking every day, ID cane in hand. Having some vision, I can tell there's a change in the elevation of the sidewalk, and that cane will tell me exactly what I have to do. I can feel the, the depth of the dip in the sidewalk or getting off the curb. It will also usually helps me avoid things that I need to avoid, like stepping on, walking in the snow, for instance. I can measure the depth ahead of me and not just walk like it was level and tumble. And he doesn't worry anymore about what others think. I no longer want to tuck my cane away. I'm proud to have it. It makes me feel com more confident, and I don't uh, hesitate to let people see it. Or if I get a child, some say, why do you have a cane? It's not very big. My cane's only about a quarter of an inch thick, and I love the opportunity to explain to the child that I don't have home, I don't see the way they see, so I need help. And that cane certainly does help fill that role. White Cane Journeys will be right back. Welcome back to White Cane Journeys. We're good to go now? Yep. Johanna Stork is pleased with how Samir Asemi's white cane skills are coming along. He is learning quite quickly, but we've been working for a few months and he's got all his local travel skills pretty much down pat. And now he'll learn how to do all of that in the winter time, which is very different, as he'll learn how to do it all with snow. And probably then in the spring, we'll start doing the more complicated travel. Supportive family and friends are also important to a successful white cane journey. So just understanding that um, starting to use a white cane is usually not easy for somebody. And so encouraging somebody to bring their white cane with them. So if you go out to Walmart together, it can be helpful for even if you're together and maybe your sister who is just starting to use a white cane is gonna take your arm and doesn't really need her white cane. It can be helpful for her just to practice carrying her white cane with her to identify herself to the other people in Walmart that she has partial sight. And then she can kind of gain that experience with her white cane. Um, while, while you're there and supporting her before she has to do it by herself. Coming down on the road. Yeah. These are the kinds of things Samir is working through with his fiance Monica. It's a new thing for her too. So sometimes, you know, maybe she might not explain it to me well enough and I'm like, well, that doesn't tell me enough, you know? And, and maybe sometimes the way I come might sound abrupt, but you know, push comes to shove. We always manage to find our way around. Sure. There's a lot of things that she's learning, but I'm gonna tell you, she's a very, very good student and very, very, very good instructor and in telling me what's around me, where we're coming to. We're walking down the street. We go out for our walks. I, I get gun shy sometimes to go and do things, but she's the one who's been encouraging me and pushing me. I thank God for her. White cane users are often put in the position of having to educate the general public. It's a role Alexis Nickerson is getting used to. My visual impairment doesn't just come up in day-to-day -day conversations. Uh, so I even have some friends that just 
don't know that I have a visual impairment. So it definitely occurred to me, um, you know, what will people think when they see me with this that, that don't know, or if they see me take it out to cross the street and then put it away. Um, because I, I think the public, just like myself, don't realize uh, a cane is appropriate and um, really helpful, even if you just have low vision, not just if you're blind. Um, so I, I think it's good to get that uh, message out there that it's not just people that are blind that use canes. Her son, Harry Nickerson, is also learning to be an advocate. He went from not really wanting to tell people, just talk about it with us at home, to telling his friends and being very open and that fall starting to do presentations at school and um, just realizing I can give other people hope with the same or similar conditions that like you don't have to let this stop you. You can get out there and have fun and keep doing what you do because that's what life is all about really. I think I started my, using my cane almost a year ago. Sometimes the other kids ask about his white cane. I usually tell them that I mostly need it at night time and that I'll sometimes bring it out if it's a crazy bright day. The first couple people that I've told, um, I, they just seem, um, seemed to take it like well. They weren't um, too, too I'm surprised. They didn't make a big reaction. I kind of told them that I wasn't too ready to tell many people, so they kind of so they kept it quiet um, um, for a little bit. And then once I started doing the pre presentation, um, everybody kind of started to know. Um, so I figured, um, so they could start to talk about it. Harry has always just been incredibly comfortable uh, with who he is and um, his vision loss took a little bit for him, of course, to accept and then tell other people. But once he did, um, he's not afraid to speak about it, to help educate uh, other people. Another thing Harry and most white cane users have to get used to is unwanted comments or staring. I'm pretty comfortable with it, but if I see a bunch of people like across the street, like just looking at me, I feel a little uncomfortable when I try to ignore them, but I don't know. I've gotten more used to it. But there was one time when I was using my cane from coming inside and it was a really bright day and it was snowy, so it was really bright out. When I was coming in, there was this guy in front of me and he was like, can you stop do I'm clicking your can against this air? And I'm like, sorry, what? <laughs> and he told, um, told me that again and I was like, uh, no, I kind of need this. I need to adjust to the light before I can stop using it. And he's like, but it's really annoying. Could you please stop? <laughs> so I kind of just walked away from that situation. Kind of mad, but kind of shook it off. I know, like, I hear that from the... Peter Parsons says Harry's confidence with his white cane is growing. I think he's adjusted uh, really well. And um, yeah, and there was one time Alexis asked me if I could chat with Harry because he was on um, a field trip in school where I think it was at a place where it was kind of dimly lit and one of the other kids made a negative comment. And so I uh, chatted with Harry about that and. Um, you know, he didn't seem uh, like it was going to discourage him from still using that cane because, of course, a lot of times that's a challenging thing to use a white cane uh, in public um, for some people. And uh, he just has such a, a great attitude. Um, of course, there's going to be challenges that come with it, but he has the right attitude and the right support to overcome any of those challenges. White Cane Journeys will be right back. Welcome back to White Cane Journeys. Although the white cane is a tool of independence, many, including Wayne Eyre, appreciate a bit of help sometimes. I think since I've lost my vision and do have a cane, I've discovered that most people have an inherent desire to do something good and helpful. And when they offer help, I always accept it. At first, I would say, no, I'll, I will do this because I needed to learn. 
But now when people offer assistance, sometimes I don't absolutely need it, but it does make me feel more confident. If there's construction on a street, for instance, I could probably get there anyway, but the fact that someone wants to take my arm and help me by that site assures me that I'm gonna be able to do it probably a lot safer. And then that person's gonna have that uh, feeling that they've made a contribution, and I think we both win. Samir Asemi is also learning how to ask for assistance. Advocating for ourselves, you know, when I need something, and instead of just being quiet about it, because uh, there's a saying, closed mouth don't get fed. And, and that's a very true statement when it comes to what I'm dealing with right now. You know, coming to grips and, and getting out of our shells and standing up and being part of society because we're still here, we're still alive, you know? Robert Ganong thinks it's all part of being a good advocate. I think that we are, you know, advocates for people with vision loss. The more positive that we can be to the general public and to our friends and to our family, it will return to us with respect. Hopefully, you know, in today's inclusion, that, you know, people will be, you know, the, in, everyone with vision loss will be looked at by society as a person first, and they just happen to have vision loss. Johanna Stork has some advice for the general public on how to assist those with sight loss. To say hello is great because a lot of the time I see um, people in the public kind of clam up and be very silent because people don't know what to do. Um, so to say good morning or excuse me or something like that because then the person can hear uh, where, where the person in the public is and it's easy just to walk around. One organization working to improve the individual and community quality of life for people who are blind or partially sighted is the Canadian Council of the Blind, or CCB. Over Zoom, from her home in Sydney, Nova Scotia, I connect with CCB President Louise Gillis. Louise, how well recognized do you think the white cane is as a symbol of blindness and low vision internationally? Well, internationally, having traveled a lot, white cane, a lot of people have no idea what it even is or what it means. Like, especially when you go through, for me, going through airports, well, why are you using that cane? Or do you have trouble walking or whatever? So a lot of people in the general population in other areas don't know it because many of the people in some countries are still basically kept behind closed doors and uh, or don't go out. So when they see somebody with a cane going about the streets and whatever, they, you kind of get stared at a lot and wondering, well, what's this thing that that person is using? So Louise, what is the CCB doing to raise awareness about the white cane? During the first full week of February, it's uh, White Cane Week. And that's when we try to get our members across the country to go out into the public and do presentations to groups, sit in malls and provide information to people and let them come and ask us and, and see what we have, show them what, what it is and why we use it and how it, it allows us to be independent. Um, so I think that's an important thing because I've gone into schools to do presentations and whatever, and the children say, well, what's that stick that you have? Or if the cane is folded up, why are you carrying all those white pencils under your arm or something? So it's still not realized enough, and that's why we need to really get that introduction of white canes out to, to people to know that it is an extension of ourselves and helps us to be independent and move about and outside our house. Yeah, I, I've been surprised sometimes at different things that people will think that my cane is either a tent pole or something for sports. I've been asked, oh, what kind of sports are you playing with that? <laughs> exactly, yes. Yeah. Well, thanks, Louise. Well, you're quite welcome, and thank you for inviting me to be here today, and I'll talk to you again. Clearly, there's still work needed to help raise awareness about the white cane. Samir, Wayne, Harry, and Alexis are all at various stages of their journeys through vision loss. 
They are all learning not only to cope, but to thrive. To any person of vision loss or that's blind, the best thing I can say is, you know, instead of sitting down, laying down, feeling sorry for ourselves, we need to get up and realize that we're still part of society and that we are still able to do a lot of things without vision. That's a sentiment Alexis and the whole Nickerson family try to live by. Our main message is just, you don't need to let it stop you and live life. Like that's yeah. what life is all about, is finding things that are, uh, make you happy and bring you joy. Johanna Stork has witnessed how using a white cane can play a role in giving people their activities back. When they learn how to get to kind of that first destination, whether it's just the mailbox or the corner store or the Tim Hortons close to their house, wherever it is, completely by themselves using a white cane and they're like, okay, that's it. I can leave the house and go somewhere by myself and I don't have to, I can get away from my husband for an hour or whatever. It's just like, yeah, great. <laughs> it's, yeah, it can be really, really great. Wayne Eyre agrees. It's going to make your life a little bit easier. It's going to give you some confidence. And the more confident you are, the better you're going to feel about yourself. And that's what it's all about in the end, really, is feeling good about yourself. And when you feel good about yourself, you can accomplish a lot more than if you're trying to hide something or behind something. And it takes sometimes it takes a little adjustment for people to accept that. And once they do, then they're on their way. Harry Nickerson has some advice for other kids receiving their first white cane. It's nothing scary. It's not going to totally affect or impact your life um, in a bad way. It's going to really help you, so don't um, be afraid to use it. Robert Ganong says some of the best moments he has facilitating the Living with Vision Loss program come when a member gains the courage to reach for a white cane. When I see someone walk out of a room or someone say, you know, what's that number? I, I want a white cane. That is the benchmark of success because that tells me that that person is ready to walk outside their own door. They are prepared to let society know that they have vision loss, but darn it, I'm going to make it. Host Laura Bain. Producers, Laura Bain, Wendy Purvis. Videographer, Andrew Pickup. Supervisor Media Accessibility, M. Williams. Audio Post, Mark Phoenix. Graphics, Andrew Antonello. Senior Producer, Michelle Dudas. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2020, Accessible Media, Inc.